Chapter 4 Flames Anna sashayed out of the burning clinic. She felt reborn as if the flames had been an inverse baptism that ushered her from the world of childhood to that of adulthood. A world more perilous and uncertain than the one in which she had previously lived. One clouded with the thick smoke of ambiguity and roasted by the tortuous heat of responsibility. But also a world far more exciting, full of leaping, flickering tongues of opportunity. The fire was a fitting symbol for this transformation, Anna reflected. Brandy was digging a trench. It's okay, Pam told him. The strafing won't begin until sunrise. Pam's mother was there. Cosplaying as Mikhail Gorbachev. Dr. Crandall handed his forehead birthmark sporting wife a cat. cat with a splint on its leg. He ran back into the building. Be careful, Mrs. Crandall yelled to her husband. USS Archon is in six days and you're my ride. But Dr. Crandall... Well, after 19 years of marriage to this terrible woman, would not have much minded a fiery death at this point. As Pam's mother berated her husband, Anna saw where Pam, still wearing the wedding dress, got her costuming talent from. The elder lady Crandall's replica of the navy blue suit that General Secretary Gorbachev had worn on October the 11th, 1986, when meeting with Ronald Reagan at Huffy in Reykjavik to discuss the reduction of mid-range European nuclear weapons was impeccable. But oh shit! The fire was spreading fast. Mom, should we take the horses and ponies out of the new barn? Pam asked. Pawnee and Anna exchanged their secret Santa gifts. The fire could spread to the barn. Their ponies were in danger. Fuck. And shit. Anna remembered that a pony would not leave a burning barn. She'd heard stories of ponies running back into a burning barn after they had been rescued. A pony thought his stall was the safest place to be, even if it was in flames. I'm going to leave the above paragraph completely intact. Let it sink in. That's exactly how fucking imbecilic ponies are. Running into a burning barn. Christ. I'm making a concerted effort in my writing to make ponies sound ridiculous, but even I couldn't come up with something that bizarre. You win this round, Jean Betancourt. Ponies. Shit. I'm telling you, Jane, these animals have a screw loose. The screw, to literalize the idiom and expand the metaphor, is there in the hole, but it's wobbling around like a fidgety drunkard on an overclocked carousel. The screw's thread has no grip at all, so any second now the whole thing's gonna fall out from the underside of that shitty Ikea couch, which your friends told you not to get. But what could go wrong, you said to them? You could handle it. You built a birdhouse once, so... Uh... You want a tighten screw, but you know that you can't. You're lying on your stomach, flashlight between your teeth, trying to get to that fucking loose screw, but it's all up in a corner by one of the couch's legs, so you can't reach it with your fingers, and the damn thing's head is fucking stripped, so your screwdriver won't do you any good. Turn that screwdriver all you want, Jane. That screw's not going anywhere. Suddenly, Anna remembered that Acorn wasn't in the barn. He was still the lost in his dark thoughts near the clinic. Anna's heart stopped beating. The young girl clutched at her chest with her grafted-on sloth arm and slowly keeled over until she lay motionless in the snow, dead from a heart attack. Pam and Pawnee rushed to aid her, but it was too late. Anna's unblinking eyes stared up at the star-strewn night sky until Pam closed them with her hand. Good night, sweet prince, she whispered. Acorn watched the flames consume the clinic silently. He immediately recognized the ambiguous positioning of the modifier in his internal monologue and changed it. Acorn silently watched the flames consume the clinic. The fire itself was deafeningly loud. Acorn was magnificent, standing there in the flickering light. He was what gods dreamed of being. He looked so fucking noble that had he been bronze, Alexander Pushkin would have written dozens of poems about him. And then Acorn would have crushed Pushkin beneath his bronze hooves. Beautiful, isn't it? Acorn shuddered. He had not noticed the cat approach him. It now sat on the fence post beside him, also looking at the fire, its tail swinging like the pendulum of that most secret of clocks, the clock that each of us carries within us, yet refuses to acknowledge until it is forcefully rent from our chests and held before our eyes, the clock that Anna had just seen the face of. Beautiful, the cat continued, but deadly. It turned to face Acorn, much like you. Its hollow eyes with midnight visions burned. Fuck off, Acorn whinnied. 
The cat shook its tiny cat head and shit just a bit. I wish I could, Acorn. I wish I could leave here and never again see the thousand sordid images of which your soul is constituted. But I... I remember what you told me earlier, interrupted Acorn. But why did you have to start this fire? What does that have to do with your plan? The cat feigned shock. What makes you think that I started this fire? After all, I'm just a cat. Acorn ignored this attempt to raise his hackles. No, Acorn's hackles were going to remain as unraised as the roof at a party DJed by John Quincy Adams, a president notorious for the non-gnarliness of his inaugural ball. Should I repeat the question, Acorn said, or do I need to crush you again? No need to get snippy, the cat replied as it began grooming itself. I started the fire because I needed to do something to kill Anna. Acorn's twitching ears betrayed his emotion. Oh, I have your attention now, do I? I just can't figure it out, what that girl means to you. You feel superior to her, which of course you are. And at times seem to hate her, but you also fear her. You are protective of her. If it was possible for one such as you to love, I might even be tempted to say, It's none of your business, Acorn said. Do what you will to me, but leave her alone. See how defensive you get? I suspect that you yourself don't know what you feel. After all, you could free yourself from her at any moment. Yet you choose to wear her saddle, subjugate yourself to her reins, dance, dance like a dancing bear, cry like a parrot, chatter like an ape. You act like a normal, mindless pony instead of the godlike prince of the galaxy that you are. Do you fear your own power? You've never given a second thought to destroying others. But do you think that unrestrained you would destroy yourself? Anna was still fucking dead. But Pawnee was not ready to let her friend go. The township began to perform CPR on Anna's body. Pam, an expert on corpses, knew it was too late. But she decided that this gesture, futile as it was, might be a part of Pawnee's grieving process, so she left her alone. The sound of fire engine sirens pierced the air. It, it aroused the ponies. They Filthy colloquialisms for horse sex emitted. Up and down the paddock. Pam and, and Pawnee were startled, too. But they were glad the firefighters were there. Anna's father was a volunteer firefighter. Pawnee hoped that he and the other firefighters could revive her friend. She stood and said thus aloud to Pam. Pam envied Pawnee's optimism and innocence. Pam and Pawnee watched the firefighters approach Anna's body. One knelt down, removed his thick glove, and felt Anna's neck for a pulse. He found none. He rose and shook his head at the two girls. Pawnee began to sob. Pam's expression of grim determination didn't so much as flicker. I will find that fucking cat, she said through gritted teeth, and I will crush its fucking head between my hands. Its brain nectars will be the emotional purel that will disinfect my soul of its grief. Pawnee stopped crying for long enough to take a wineskin full of gin out from her boot and drain it in one gulp. She had a serious problem. Acorn and the cat watched as the firefighters extinguished the blaze. Without the violent light of the fire, the night seemed suddenly claustrophobic. Now the sky was illuminated only by the cooler, paler fires of the moon, the stars, and the flashing lights on the assembled emergency vehicles. The snow no longer fell in individual sparkling flakes. It was now a single heavy sheet of gray and cold that pressed down on Acorn with the cumulative weight of the centuries of snow that had already fallen on his defiant shoulders. But Acorn was no Atlas. He could not hold the weight forever. Both he and the cat were acutely aware of this fact. The fire trucks pulled away. The moon continued to shine. The snow continued to fall. Acorn continued. I'm not going with you, Acorn said at last. The cat licked one of its white paws nonchalantly. I know. Acorn lunged forward and bit off the cat's head with one snap of his mighty jaws. The cat's body toppled from the fence post to the ground, and Acorn spat out the severed head beside it. "'Are you trying to annoy me?' said a voice from the darkness. "'You aren't succeeding.' The cat pranced into view along the fence and jumped down to sit on its own dead body. It playfully batted the severed head with one paw, like a feline cephalophore. "'Cephalophore is a really good word,' thought both Acorn and the cat. Acorn gazed at the impossible being. He felt as if his mind, which had up until that point been expanding, was starting to collapse in on itself. 
If his mind was a Friedman model universe, its density parameter, omega, would have just exceeded 1, meaning its actual density, rho, was greater than the critical density rho sub c, approximately 5 monatomic hydrogen atoms per cubic meter, as determined by the equation rho sub c equals 3hx squared over 8 pi g, where g is Newton's gravitational constant and h is a function of time, triggering a terminal contraction of said universe. That's what Acorn felt like. Tell me your name, Acorn said. The cat started shitting for the umpteenth time. I go by Acorn Winnie to Furious Winnie like a fucking car alarm hopped up on cheap amphetamines. If you say I go by many names, I swear to fucking God I will wreck you. The cat flicked its tail. Now, I was going to say I go by Minos, a single name. You, however... Granny, Leath Macha, Arian, the Darley Arabian, Eclipse, both Cincinnati and Traveler. I always thought Xanthos had a nice ring to it, but now... Acorn. The cat's adorable little nose crinkled in disgust. A dull name for a domesticated beast. Why did you give it up? The names, the power, all of it. Acorn is a name of strength. A huge, mighty creature that has temporarily chosen dormancy, but has the potential to spring back in even grander form at any moment. Yes, if dropped in fertile soil, but it is far more likely that it will fall impotently onto the sterile roof of a patio and be eaten by a squirrel. But it may, if it wishes, sprout within the stomach of the squirrel, rending the flesh of the weak rodent from within until it... No, it can't. That's not how seeds work. And you know as well as I do that the name isn't the fucking point. Why are you pretending to be that which you are not? Acorn responded by crushing the cat yet again. Where are the animals that were in the clinic? Pam asked Mrs. Crandall. Well, as the narrative abruptly shifted back to the humans. Your dad Pawnee brought them to my office in the old barn, Mrs. Crandall answered her birthmark makeup beginning to run from the heat-induced sweat trickling down her forehead from underneath her bald cap. Pam was just glad that Pawnee was no longer weeping over the stiffening body of their friend. Anna, I've been looking all over for you, one of the firefighters said. It was Anna's father. Pam hardly recognized him. His face was preternaturally pale, and his eyes seemed to glow faintly red. Reflecting the still smoldering embers of the fire, Pam wondered, not yet suspecting what forces were working through him. From his words, it seemed that the poor man had not yet realized that his daughter was dead, Pam thought sadly. She watched the soot-stained firefighter kneel over Anna's body in the snow. He took off his helmet and held Anna's hand. You okay? he asked. I'm fine, Anna answered. Sitting up, Pam gasped in shock. The girl had been indisputably dead for the last ten minutes. How is this possible? Not even in the most forbidden of dark magic books had Pam seen anything that could explain this seemingly miraculous revival. Anna gave her father a quick hug. See you later, Dad, she said. Pam decided not to question her friend's resurrection for the moment. Anna seemed unaware of her own death, so Pam led her to the barn office without comment. But Pam was cautious. It was likely that this was not the same Anna that she had once known. Dr. Crandall was putting a fresh bandage on Brandy's wound. Pam... Please get, get a clean pair of Sturmhose for this reprehensible war criminal, he said. They're in the closet under the hayloft ladder. Anna, could you, you sedate Brandy for a second? While Anna pressed the ether-soaked rag over Brandy's face, she looked around the barn office. The Pony Palace bound volumes of NYPD blue fanfiction were piled in a corner. Portable kennels were set up around the room. The sloth whose arm Anna had taken was, was in one kennel. Two other cats and a dog were in kennels, too. The third dog was lying to himself if he thought that his new haircut didn't make him look like a washed-up daytime talk show host. There had been three dogs, three cats and one sloth, in the kennel room that day. Now Pam saw only two cats, three dogs, and the resentful sloth. She let out a sigh of relief. The black cat was missing. Hopefully burned to a crisp like a neglected bagel bite in a toaster oven. Anna felt a coldness that she had never before experienced. What had happened to her after she collapsed, she wondered. Did she die in the fire? Was this the afterlife? If so, the afterlife was really shitty. She tapped her sloth claws on the table in front of her, rhythmically, and pondered the consequences of her own existence as she had never done before. Pam, looking at her from across the room, was doing the same.
Detective Pony was originally written by Gene Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Gene Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee. Mother of God. Deep breaths. We can do this. We can do this. That would just be self-indulgent, would it? It would just be self-indulgent, huh? Would it be self-indulgent? That would just be self-indulgent. Yeah, I'm starting to get how this works. Where was I? <laughs>